Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. <clears throat> this is the second <clears throat> in a series that uh, the Scholl Chair has been doing on supply chains, which is a popular topic these days. Everybody wants to know about uh, what's happening to supply chains and how the uh, how the pandemic is uh, affecting them and what's going to happen as, as industries attempt to reconstruct them as we recover. <clears throat> what we thought we, we would do at CSIS is to look at that question in the context of specific industries. And a couple of weeks ago, we did one specifically on the fashion industry. Uh, and today we're going to look at the automobile industry. And uh, we're going to talk about what's changed, uh, what's going to change, uh, what was changing anyway, because one of the things we've learned over the last few months is there were a lot of trends that were underway over the last uh, couple of years, uh, particularly in terms of shortening and real regionalization of supply chains. Uh, that started uh, before the pandemic, but which may have been accelerated uh, by the pandemic or alternatively may have been blocked. So we'll be exploring uh, those questions, asking what's changed, what's going to change, and what is a continuation of, of, uh, of the old. Uh, the format we're going to follow <clears throat> is the same as before if you've been with us in the past. Uh, each of our guests is going to make some opening comments and then I'm going to interview them for a while, and then we will go to questions uh, from all of you. If you have not already submitted a question and want to, there is a button on our event page on the CSIS website that you can click on, and then you can submit your questions live. And we will be monitoring those and uh, feeding them to me, and I will then ask them. So <clears throat> if you, that doesn't work for you, uh, send an email directly to the person who's doing the monitoring, which is John Robeson, my program coordinator, which is jrobison, J-R-O-B-I-S-O-N, at csis.org. Uh, but clicking on the link, uh, I think, uh, works better. Uh, so the we are uh, scheduled for uh, for about an hour, and I'll look forward to getting your questions as, as we go on. We're very fortunate today to have two real experts on uh, on this sector. And I'm going to introduce them to you uh, to you briefly. <clears throat> I think some of, they're probably both uh, well known to many of you. Uh, John Bozella is the CEO and president of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Uh, before that, he was the CEO and president of one of its predecessor organizations, uh, which was the Association of Global Automakers. And prior to that, he's had an extensive career uh, <clears throat> in the automobile industry, including working for, for several companies. Um, not General Motors, apparently, but um, that's um, we won't hold that against him. Uh, <clears throat> our other guest is from General Motors, and that's someone that I expect uh, many of you know well because of his uh, past positions. And that's Everett Eisenstadt, who is the Senior Vice President for Global Public Policy uh, at GM and has been for just about the last two years. Prior to that, uh, he was at the White House as the Deputy Assistant President for International Economic Affairs and Deputy Director of the National Economic Council. Uh, of note, he really was, uh, was the Sherpa. Uh, he was our key negotiator for the G20 APEC and G7 International Economic Summits. Uh, before that, uh, Everett had two stints on the Hill as uh, Chief uh, Trade Counsel for the Senate Finance Committee. And in between the two, he was at USTR as the Assistant USTR for, uh, for the Americas. So he has a long and varied career in the trade business, <clears throat> and I think is a good friend of all of you out there that are also in that business. So with that, uh, let's go right uh, to our speakers, and we're going to start with John. So John, you go ahead and, and make some comments, then we'll go to Everett, Everett, and then the three of us will have a conversation. John, go ahead. Well, great. Bill, thank you very much for having me, and to CSIS, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to have this dialogue today, and I really do hope that it is an engaging dialogue. So uh, I'll try and be brief, but let me do a little bit of framing. Uh, first, who is uh, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation? We represent 
uh, all the major automotive manufacturers that operate in the US market, 99% of new car sales. We represent most of the tier one suppliers as well as tech companies uh, and other new entrants to the mobility space. So we represent the auto industry broadly. Uh, as Bill referenced briefly, we are the result of a merger of two predecessor automotive trade associations here in the Washington environment. Uh, and uh, we're now united uh, and working together uh, to express one broad, clear point of view about automotive innovation. Our mission in three words is cleaner, safer, smarter. That's our focus at the intersection of public policy and automotive innovation. Um, you know, as we talk about supply chains and the automotive industry, I think it's helpful also to, rep to, to get a little bit of a level setting about what the U.S. auto industry looks like today. Uh, roughly 10 million Americans rely on this industry in one way or another for their livelihoods. And that doesn't include the tech sector and the new mobility sector that I referenced. It's about 6% of GDP, and we're the largest manufacturing sector uh, in the US economy. Uh, I like to think about sort of the, this period in reference to the last period of great tumult, the great recession that this industry and the broader US economy went through. Um, if you go back to that period of time, really the US auto industry really led the US economic resurgence out of the, the great recession. Um, we added a quarter of all manufacturing jobs back into the economy since the Great Recession. Today, more than 40,000 more Americans are working in the automotive sector than were before the Great Recession. So it's, it's been a really good story, a good story of the American uh, auto industry resurgence, really from the depths of the Great Recession to this period. And then COVID hit. And so, you know, the last couple of years, we've seen record or near record sales. Uh, and then uh, what we saw, of course, in the immediate response to COVID was an enormous demand shock uh, as a result of shutdown, uh, stay at home orders and, and, and closure orders. Uh, there was no demand for vehicles. Uh, that resulted in the complete shutdown of the US automotive manufacturing uh, machine, for lack of a better term. For the first time since World War II, there was no automotive production in the United States. However, that didn't mean that General Motors, Ford Motor Company, and others stopped working. They, in fact, began to work immediately on responding to the pandemic, and so focused on the development and the production of very, very uh, needed uh, medical equipment, um, uh, medical devices like respirators and uh, ventilators, as well as personal protective equipment to respond to the pandemic. This was not just an effort of manufacturers to retool a manufacturing plant here or there. What you saw was the ability of these companies to really reimagine supply chains to focus on the production of this type of equipment and these type of devices to really refocus their uh, logistics prowess and to really add to uh, and respond to the crisis uh, from a healthcare uh, point of view. Um, these, there are stories abounding across the industry about this response. We issued a, a corporate social responsibility report just recently about this, which you can find at, at autosinnovate.org that tells that whole story, but it's everything from the development and manufacturing of this equipment, partnering with healthcare providers, uh, to reimagining the interior of vehicles to be able to transport COVID-19 positive patients. Uh, it, all, all of that, uh, as well as the donation of vehicles and the transporting of meals to first responders. So it was an immediate response uh, that, that frankly, uh, I think those of us in the industry and have been in the industry for some time, we're proud to be, uh, at least in my case, a, sm a small part of. Um, the other thing we had to do is we had to also begin to imagine how to restart this machine that was completely shut down. Uh, and so that meant to thinking about this broad, complicated supply chain and how to make sure that a safe restart uh, could happen in a lined way. 
Uh, and so um, maybe we'll get into this in more detail in, in, in the questions and answers, but that exercise of aligning manufacturing across a broad supply chain and, a, and not, not only within the United States, but with, with regard to key trading partners was an enormous uh, challenge that I think we've managed fairly well so far, although there you know, will continue to be some uh, bumps uh, along, along that road. So where are we today? You know, frankly, automotive demand has responded from the, 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 the depths of the demand shock much more quickly, I think, than most analysts, and certainly I would have imagined. Um, we can get into maybe in questions and answers why that is and why the U.S. experience for automotive demand coming out of COVID is different, for example, than it is in Europe, uh, but it is. Uh, and so um, what we're really seeing now is, frankly, shortages in key uh, product, uh, uh, product areas and a need for production to catch up to that. So what happens post-COVID? Well, here, there's a lot of uncertainty. What does the economy look like? What does the recession post-pandemic uh, uh, look like? What does mobility look like in an environment where people have gotten a little bit more used to uh, working from home? What does the price of oil uh, look like? Uh, and therefore, how does that affect the demand for, say, electrified uh, vehicles? These are all big questions that we need to continue to, to analyze and understand. So a lot of uncertainty right now as we start to come out of uh, the demand and the supply shock. So, you know, one more, you know, piece of perspective, and then I'll, I'll, turn, it, I'll turn it back to Bill and Everett. Uh, really, the question now is how can the industry that has invested enormous amounts of capital to manage through this demand shock and this production stoppage also continue to invest in transformative technologies going forward? And this is where our partnership with policymakers is critically important. How do we create the right framework for the testing and deployment of highly automated vehicles that will save lives? How do we ensure that there is safety spectrum available for connectivity that will save uh, people's lives? How do we make sure that we've got the appropriate uh, investments in public infrastructure for electrified vehicles? And so these are all things I think we have to work on to make sure that the state of automotive innovation is strong as we recover from the pandemic and that there is therefore support for a robust supply chain here in the region and really across the globe. Sorry. Thank you very much, John. Uh, let's go right to Everett. Great. I thought you might have said that, Bill, but I, I wanted to. Uh, yeah, well, to be sure. I was following I instructions. I was following yeah. instructions to mute myself, and then I, I forget. Go ahead. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. Well, you know, thank you first, Bill, for inviting us to be part of this. And, and it's really exciting to be on the program with John, uh, who has taken over for the Auto Innovators. Um, I'll just say that the innovators represents a lot of what is going on with the industry today. It is not the industry that you think about, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. There's so much transformation, um, both on the propulsion system from an internal combustible engine to the electric vehicles, but also how the vehicle interacts with the consumer and with its environment through the technology that is continuing to advance. Uh, it's just very, very exciting sector to work in. And... Um, I recall when I was on the Hill, you mentioned my Hill background, I always, uh, one of the things I enjoyed the most was talking to companies about, you know, what does trade mean to you? Because I knew it in the abstract, but it's, it's one thing to, to, to be, you know, to think about the philosophy of trade, the laws, but then, but to actually have to implement and execute, we wanted to be sure that we were serving industry. And um, I was always fascinated by the auto industry and the supply chains and how, robust and complex they were, and just really stunned that a enterprise could capture the complexity and do what they do. And um, never thought I'd be part of the auto industry. Uh, have now been to the factories, I've seen the work, it is phenomenal. So it's a super exciting time to be part of it. You've chosen a really important topic and I'm, I'm glad to have a chance to share with you today. Um, I'll just say that um, it is really a critical time for us. Um, there's a lot going on and um, a lot of it's unpredictable. Um, of course, we're gonna talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, but I do wanna touch on one thing that my CEO has raised uh, recently that I think is a very important topic. 
Um, and that is the fight against systemic racism that is really um, kind of, you know, reemerged as a, as a primary topic of conversation throughout the country. And, and uh, my CEO, Mary Barra, is very committed to making sure that we are doing everything we can as a company to address those uh, systemic racism that exists, if any, within our company, but also to do what we can around the country and as uh, with our stakeholders to to have a real dialogue and real understanding. So I'm I'm really proud to be part of uh, that work. I'm very proud to work with Mary Barr. I think she's a terrific CEO. Uh, one of the things that she did almost immediately upon seeing the George Floyd video, which is highly beyond disturbing, um, is she basically sent a letter out to all all employees and she said, "Look, this we're not just going to talk about we got to talk about what what can we do." And uh, just in the past few weeks, we've committed. Um, a, a, $10 million to help fight systemic racism. Um, and that's just the beginning of what we can do. Mary has also created an, um, an inclusion advisory board to help us both internally and externally do everything we can as a company. So I'm super proud to be part of that. Um, and, and really, um, it's an additional challenge we have on top of the pandemic and it's real and we need to, to do what we can to address it. Now the pandemic, you know, we we saw it coming from China. Um, really had no idea of uh, its magnitude or impact, and it kind of just rolled across the the Pacific and the Atlantic. There, um, I will say we were hit hard. I mean, if you see the 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 production, as as John said, it just plummeted. I mean, we went into one of the first things we did was full stop. Uh, we took our workers and shut the factories down, quarantined. Um, you know, tried to capture everything that was going on around the country and be compliant with both the state, local, and federal regulations. There were, you know, a lot to monitor, a lot to digest, not just in our industry, but industries across the, uh, the country. But, you know, for us, um, and, and Mary has made this clear, safety is always our number one priority, both in the vehicles that we build, but also uh, for our workers in our community. So we really wanted to do everything we could to ensure the safety of our of our workforce and um, really pulled everybody out, evaluated the situation and have been working hard to, uh, to, to do the right thing. And I'll just say, you know, I was really, it's amazing to me that it, this was just March because we, we had an amazing pivot from no production of autos, which was stunning, stunning development to producing uh, PPEs and masks and ventilators and partnering with, you know, companies we never would have imagined would be our partners. Uh, you know, we had a, a, a Ventec is a ventilator company that um, was looking for a partner who had access, you know, manufacturing expertise, uh, supply chain capabilities, and the ability to harness both. And we connected with them very early and just said, okay, what can we do together to make sure we have the equipment that is needed in this country for our frontline uh, health workers? And I am so impressed with our team um, and what they've done. It was just, it's just stunning. So as John said, you know, manufacturing life-saving equipment, including personal productive, uh, protective equipment, critical care innovators, just to give you a little sense of scale. Um, today, GM has delivered more than 3.2 million masks, 185,000 face shields, and 5,000 critical care ventilators, and we're well on our way to having 30,000 out the door by August. And now remember, this is something we just started a few months ago. So it's really impressive and it just shows the what the auto industry can do when it's faced with a challenge and, and what it can do for our country. So I'm very proud to be part of that initiative. Um, and as John also pointed out, you know, we, we want to get back to the business of producing vehicles. Um, he noted that with the with the recovery going on, uh, inventory is not super um it's not like you just got an abundance of vehicles and people don't want them. In fact, people want vehicles. Uh, if anything, there's a little bit of tightening in the inventory. Uh, so we're really excited to be able to start up our plants again, but to do so in a safe, gradual way to ensure that, you know, we aren't exposing our workforce to unnecessary risks and we're taking every protocol we can. And um, I'm again, I'm very proud of what GM has done because we work with our, uh, we have a, uh, a health officer within our company and manufacturing partnered with them. We looked at the CDC, we looked at the World Health Organization uh, criteria. We developed a playbook or protocol for bringing people back into the factory safely. And it's not just a playbook. People have to feel confident that they can come into the factory, that they're going to be safe, that we care about them, and 
and that they're going to be able to do their work in a safe environment. So um, it's a tremendous effort, and the safety protocols to date have worked very, very well. Um, we've started a gradual restart of our manufacturing. We expect to be up to almost full production, not as far as we'd like to go. We can do better, but we expect to have all our plants operating uh, very soon, if not by the end of this month. So very um, – it's been an incredible three months and I can talk about supply chain issues. And I know you want to talk about that and we'll have an opportunity to do that uh, because it is, it is a fascinating area. So um, just a little overview of what's been going on over the past few months, Bill. And, and again, thanks for uh, having me and John on today. It's a real, real honor to be with you. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, that was uh, very helpful. Let's, let's uh, uh, pursue a couple of the, of the doors you opened in, in your comments. First, John, I want to go back to something you said that intrigued me about the, that the industry was uh, rebounding uh, faster than you had expected. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit more about that? And you mentioned the word shortages, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. Are you talking about uh, supply chain gaps or supply chain uh, shortages, or are you talking about difficulty simply in restarting production uh, and getting the workers uh, back in place? Or are you talking about or what is what is back and what problems have you encountered in getting back up and running? Great. So I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you separated those two things. So first, let's just talk about what's happening on the demand side. Um, at the low point, uh, what's what's now the low point of the market, the last week of March. If you look at say weekly sales, the last week of March sales were down 60 percent against pre-COVID. Uh, uh, pr pr uh, projections. And so that's an enormous reduction in demand. Several million vehicles evaporated from the U.S. market. Um, this last week, sales were down 4% against pre-COVID uh, projections. And so, you know, there's a V in terms of automotive uh, demand. And so uh, why, why did it bounce back so quickly? I think two reasons. Um, one, dealers, uh, franchise dealers here in the U.S. were incredibly creative about shifting to online sales as well as contactless deliveries. Um, you know, dealers were, frankly, I think in some, some uh, critics might argue, slow to embrace these tools, but were quick to embrace them during the crisis. The second reason sales came back so quickly uh, was, th was that, frankly, uh, manufacturers put a lot of capital into the marketplace. They, we saw 0% 84-month loans and lease subventions and other uh, tools in the toolbox to the tune of about $5,000 a vehicle. So the combination of those two things really accelerated the recovery in sales. Where we, their gaps are in a couple of, or the shortages are in a couple of places. What's happening now is since production has lagged this increase in demand, um, there is a little bit of tightness in vehicle inventory. Um, also, what we're seeing is that the, the restart of production has not been completely seamless. Frankly, as an industry veteran, it's been much more smooth than I thought it would be, but we've seen some, um, some supply shortages, for example, with regard to components coming out of Mexico and particularly certain regions of Mexico where the the safe restart has been a little slower than it has been in the United States. So that's been kind of a noticeable uh, shortage, uh, perhaps for some manufacturers on the supply side. Everett, do you want to add anything? No, I think John really encapsulated it very, very well. I mean, it's, it's, you know, hitting supply and demand perfectly is one of the greatest challenges I think any sector has, but particularly when you've got long lead times like autos, Consumer, you know, <laughs> taste change, um, the economy changes. You always want to get ahead and give the consumer what they want. And um, it's challenging in an environment like this with the integrated supply chains to just restart the machine. Um, it's actually, as John said, it's gone a lot more smoothly than I would have expected. Uh, but there is tightness. And... Um, it, it, you know, it's tightness in, in, in inventory, but it's, uh, you know, also just uh, sometimes getting, you know, the suppliers being able to uh, produce the part necessary to get a factory running can be a real challenge. Um, but overall, we're pretty, we're cautiously optimistic. I mean, the overall health of the economy will be very important. Um, but as John said, there's, there's been a good dynamic. Uh, people are still interested in 
in driving. They're interested in having automobiles, and we are uh, uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure we, we are able to provide them with with the, the kind of vehicle they want and the time that they want. There may be two. Um kind of contradictory trends here that, that we're talking about. And I'd like to ask you to comment on that. On the one hand, one of the things we've noticed, um, I think in your industry, but not only in your industry, is uh, a, a trend that began uh, pre-COVID to shorten uh, supply chains and to regionalize supply chains. And I think later on, uh, we'll get to USMCA and talk about how that's affected your supply chains. But uh, at the same time, what John was just talking about is the the uneven nature of the recovery uh, is that inevitably some areas are going to recover faster than others for any number of reasons, and that in the case of Mexico, it appears to be slower uh, than at least it is for you. Um, so, but that is an, if you're going to shorten your supply chains, that's kind of a natural place to look because it's close. Uh, Talk to us a little bit, uh, either one of you or both, about um, how you see supply chains uh, changing pro, uh, pro, uh, post-COVID. Are you shortening them? Uh, how does this affect your, uh, what you're doing in both Canada and Mexico? Uh, and how does this affect uh, uh, your supply chains that involve China? Uh, Everett, you want me to jump in first and then... Um... I'll give some general comments and then maybe Everett can uh, speak more specifically uh, yeah. from a company perspective. Uh, I think, um, Bill, I think regionalization is a really good word it, it, to describe what I think is starting to happen uh, it, it, with, with supply chains, although I wouldn't want to describe this as a, as a significant trend yet, but it certainly seems to be moving in this direction. And I think it is moving in this direction for a number of reasons. Uh, one is it's related to trade agreements and notably USMCA. Obviously, the USMCA rules of origin are going to really, I think, from at least my personal point of view, really require much more uh, regional content in vehicles traded in, in the hemisphere. Uh, I think another reason that you're seeing regionalization is the uncertainty of uh, tariffs. Um, and certainly the U.S.-China tariff dynamic um, uh, makes uh, regionalization or shortened supply chains uh, uh, make more sense. I think risk is a third scenario, uh, a third reason rather, um, you know, risk related to COVID uh, as well as, as, as broader economic risk. So I think th those are the reasons why I think we're seeing uh, a little bit of shortening uh, going on in the automotive supply chain. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if shortening is how I would describe it, but there is definitely a, um, at least in policy circles, a di dialogue about resilience, right? You need to, you can't just be dependent upon one supplier for an input that is, you know, fundamental to your whole uh, production line. I think and that, that's been shown many times, but I think recent history has really brought that home. And for us at GM, I think one of the, uh, one of the, the tsunami in Japan was really telling. Um, that was a little bit of a wake up call. It's like, look, we've got to be prepared with a very, very robust uh, team ready to react almost in an emergency way to address these types of disruptions because they're going to happen. And just because you have a shortened supply chain doesn't mean you're not going to have a disruption. It could be a disruption. There could be a fire, you know, here or an earthquake there. The idea is, 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 <laughs> You know, not to just keep everything in one place because that's not a good idea because you can lose everything, but to have resilience in your supply chain so you can react quickly. And that's both ability to get product, but also knowing how to manage the complexity of a supply chain. And that's a real special skill and it takes a real team to be able to do it. So it's, it's, we may see more uh, regionalization, as John said. I'm not sure you're going to see necessarily everything coming together in one place or really consolidating because that in and of itself may not be the right answer for uh, creating, uh, averting risk or mitigating risk in the supply chain. It's a very complex balance. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the word resilience because that leads me right right to the, ne the, ne the next question. Uh, one, of, there, there seem to be two new words that have cropped up in the supply chain world. One is resilience, the other is redundancy. Uh, and the need to have more than one place to go or more than one source for parts, particularly uh, so you don't get caught by choke points where you 
have a sole supplier that suddenly has a problem. Uh, think about that and think about uh, just in time delivery. Are we going back to uh, are we going back to inventories and stockpiling? Not of finished vehicles, but inventories of parts and components and stockpiling of parts and components uh, and moving away from uh, just in time delivery. Or are we sticking with the uh, the model that that you guys have pursued for the last twenty plus years? Yeah, I probably am not the best person to answer the question per se because it's it's it may depend on the input. Um, uh, and, and and we you know supply chains can be through suppliers or we can create our own um, inputs, right? And so let's just take uh, battery technology. It's something that we're very interested in advancing electric vehicles as quickly as possible. Um, we could rely on other suppliers for that, but we actually think as a uh, that one of the best ways to uh, achieve resilience in the in the supply of battery technology and improvement in battery technology is to try to do it is to do it ourselves, right? So we entered into a joint venture with LG Chem in Ohio, so we could have access to a steady supply of battery uh, technology and production uh, because that can be a choke point. So I think it depends on the input. Uh, some of the more specialized products. Um, you may not want to inventory them, right? They can be highly expensive. Uh, you may not need them for every vehicle. So I think it's really a case by case basis. And I wouldn't want to make a categorical uh, assertion that, you know, we're all, we're, we're going to do um, a lot of inventory stocking and, or we're not, because I think it really is dependent upon uh, the, the input and, and the vehicle and, uh, you know, your relationship with your suppliers. It's, it's just very, very complicated. John, do you have, want to add something? Yeah, no, I, I I would agree. I would agree with Everett, and 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 that the the idea of redundancy in inventory is what I was trying to get at, and I, and I agree with Everett that sh to to use the term shortening is probably overly simplistic, um, but that there is something to that in the sense that um, you know I I think inventory just generally it's too early to tell what that looks like. Uh, stocking of parts and those types of things, uh, different components. But I do, I do think that as we come out of COVID, um, you know, companies will continue to reevaluate what what supply chains look like, uh, given uh, given uh, the the risk environment, the trade environment, and the broader economic environment. As you restart, are are uncoordinated or different responses from state, federal, and foreign governments a factor and uh, make it uh, complicated. And I'll, I'll add a specific thing. We're starting to get questions, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I'm gonna go out of order because one of them is, is germane to what uh, I just asked you, which is you know, in responding to uh, you know, uncoordinated government responses, maybe you can also comment about uh, fuel standards uh, mm -hmm. in this context and particularly California other states, and, and so, and one of the questions is, uh, this is forever, really, where does a company like GM or others, if John wants to comment, stand on, on the question of conflicting fuel standards and how will it navigate a bifurcated standard if that emerges? So kind of marry those two questions together, talk about <laughs> supply chain responses and fuel standard responses. John, okay, so they're Everybody very different. Yeah, I'll go first and say, okay. ask specifically about GM. Um, I think that it was, I mean, first you gotta just keep in mind that like, as, as John said, you know, it's not just the manufacturer, it's the auto dealers, it's the um, customer and consumer care, you know, people need their vehicle service, they need parts. We needed to, you know, provide parts to first responders. We have an OnStar uh, capability, which is an emergency response system that, that is very much uh, part of the first responder network. And so it's a really complex question when you say, you know, the differing regulations. So I think where we probably saw it most prevalently is and when you look at local, state, and federal was, well, who can operate? What dealers can operate? What uh, customer care operations can operate? What warehouses can be open? Uh, what's considered essential? So getting our arms around what was considered an essential industry in a particular location was a challenge. And, and I will say uh, not to, uh, there were some organizations, including the National Association of Manufacturers 
that was, you know, constantly working this on behalf of manufacturers, trying to determine who's essential, who's not, getting the information out. So in that sense, it was very challenging uh, to track. Uh, so, yeah, that was definitely an impact on who could be open and who could service a vehicle um, and dealing with our, you know, managing our dealer network was, was a real challenge. Um, on the fuel standards, I mean, we would love to have one national standard. Um, you know, our we my CEO is very, um, uh, very committed to zero emissions as one of our uh, uh, fundamental corporate objectives. And we think the way to do that is to go to electric vehicles as fast as possible. So. Um, that's why we're investing so much capital into it. Uh, instead of hybrids, we really think battery electric vehicles are the way to get uh, fuel economy standards uh, lower, you know, to get them more efficient, faster. Um, so, yeah, we, we have talked about that. We've talked about how we'd love to see a national zero emission vehicle program. Um, it's a really important thing for the United States to be able to come around one national standard um, so the industry can coalesce and and, and utilize its capital in, a, in the most efficient way. Because as John has pointed out, capital is um, is a big part of, of, of transformation and um, you know it's not unlimited. So it's, it's uh, one national standard would be very, very attractive. John? Yes, so um, just to build on what Everett said about the essential nature of automotive manufacturing service and supply chain, we started with the Department of Homeland Security to focus on ensuring that there was appropriate guidance on that question. And once the federal government through the Department of Homeland Security was able to issue that guidance, it allowed for alignment to happen uh, uh, along key, uh, among key automotive production and supply states in the United States, for example, as well as with key trading partners like Canada and Mexico. And so, you know, that that designation and that guidance from the Department of Homeland Security was helpful because it allowed government officials to align around that notion that this is essential. Um, and so that that's where that's where the alignment came together. But yes, the, the, the premise to the question that without alignment, you know, you, you do have uh, starts and stops or we would have had starts and stops. So that alignment was critical. With regard, to, with regard to fuel economy and greenhouse gas emissions, the industry has for some time believed in the following things. One, continued yearly improvements in fuel economy and reductions in greenhouse gases. Uh, two, tools in the toolbox to support, to support the shift to low carbon mobility. And three, to have one aligned set of programs, one national standard, as Everett said, one al alignment among state and, and federal regulators. And so we, we clearly don't have that right now. We need to continue to work toward it um, because that is not only going to be the most efficient use of capital, as Everett said, but it will provide the best value to consumers. Uh, and will ensure that we have market uh, investments and market behavior aligned with, with important uh, governmental goals. As you move toward electric vehicles, which uh, Everett just talked about is uh, something that's very important to his company, how is that going to affect your, your existing supply chains and your existing facilities? Can you just start making them in the, the same plants with the same workers and the same machinery? Or is there a, a whole new investment that's involved? Who wants to go first? Uh, well, I can say for, for GM, I mean, we're, there is new investment. I mean, we, we actually are, um, uh, we're very proud to uh, announce the uh, battery electric truck will be produced in a plant in uh, Detroit Hamtramck. Um, and we've taken the factory and we have uh, uh, transformed it to four battery electric vehicles. And it is a bit of a different supply chain, but I think the manufacturing expertise necessary to build a solid, safe vehicle is very much uh, at the core of the company. So different inputs, uh, different challenges, but the mindset and the management and the workforce to go in and address those challenges, take them on and meet them is what we, uh, I think is what really puts us at the forefront. Um, I'll also say one of the coolest things about being part of GM for the past couple of years is is watching, uh, you know, I went out to a battery electric, uh, we have a plant in Orion um, that produces 
uh, the bolt and you go in there and it, the factory is, uh, it's obviously Spartan. I mean, not Spartan, but sparkles, everything very clean in all our manufacturing operations. It is so quiet. It is so different than what you go into in, uh, say, a truck factory. Um, very complicated to put it all together. Just a very different dynamic. Same workforce, um, but, but very different production. Um, the other thing that's super interesting, I think, about it is is having that battery electric truck in Detroit, uh, the, the joint venture with LG Chem in um, Lordstown, Ohio, and the uh, we also you know work with LG Chem. They've got a facility, a battery facility up in Michigan. I think this is really transforming the Rust Belt to the Tech Belt, and it is it's an untold story that is absolutely happening across Mid America. The technology in the auto sector will transform, um, uh, will be transformative and it will transform supply chains, how people work, and will really bring some rich new opportunities to parts of the country that that really um, have the workforce and the ability to, to meet them and need the opportunity. So that's really exciting to me and, and, and a big part of what I, what I love about being part of the company. Yeah, the, you know, you, the, there is, the, we're definitely seeing uh, investments across the country as ever talked about. I, you know, there's a, there's a challenge here. Um, clearly, the, it, when you think about the supply chain broadly, I mean, you've got to go all the way to the raw materials that go into the battery chemistry and the like. And so, you know, this is a, this is the global industry, uh, it, you know, and there is, uh, frankly, a global competition. Uh, between the United States, China, Europe, and others to, you know, develop the the infrastructure and the supply chains and the manufacturing know-how to be able to win in, in this environment. So I do think it's important that we um, it's important that we um, make sure uh, that we're working together, both the private sector and the public sector, to create the right environment for that investment. Okay. This is uh, there are two more topics I want to cover, and then we've got a few questions uh, from our participants uh, that I want to pass on to you. The first topic is uh, no discussion of this of supply chains would be complete without talking about the workers. Uh, obviously, when you shut down production, uh, the workers got shut down. So the question is, uh, are they all coming back? Are some of them coming back? Uh, what's going to happen to your uh, to your workforce? Are you are you shifting to uh, uh, more machines, uh, or do you expect to rehire really everybody? Uh, give us some uh, perspective on that. Everett, why don't we start with you from the perspective of your company, sure. and we'll go to John. Okay, thanks. It's a good question, and it's really one of the challenges I think that a lot of companies are facing, not just in autos, but, but in other sectors. Is you know, there's so many individual circumstances. Uh, people have, uh, they may have children at home, they have elderly parents, they, you know, and with the schools closed and uh, it's challenging for people. They can't just leave their children. And so a lot of the uh, ability of individuals to come to work is circum is, is gonna be, um, you know, de dependent upon the individual situation themselves. Um, we want to ensure that with our workforce, they can come to work with confidence. And um, we've had good uh, uh, participation by the workforce in coming to our factories and, and, and producing. Um, but how do we deal with a, with a world in which the traditional supports for communities and families may not be present? So we'll see what happens when, when the... Um, when, when school starts and we'll, we'll manage that. One of the things that my, uh, our CEO has said is that she wants us to use this as an opportunity to think about how we do our work, how we can do our work more efficiently and how we can be responsive to the needs of our, of our workers and employees. Um, so it's a really, it's like I'd say, you, you asked a great question. It's like the next cusp of challenges. You know, it's, it's just been one challenge after another and you've really identified one that I think we're struggling with now and working through um, both as a company, but I think as a country. So um, no clear answer on it, but it is it is something we are thinking through very deeply. Well, it is a struggle and it's, it's an important question. Doing work, doing your work more efficiently uh, sometimes means doing your work with fewer workers. And of course, with uh, unemployment now at 13%, uh, and, and, and the indicators that I've seen suggest that while uh, the economy will recover, uh, uh, employment is going to recover more slowly than growth. 
Uh, so we're going to have, I think, higher unemployment for some time. So the decisions that the companies like yours make about, uh, about the workforce are important. Uh, John, do you want to add to that? Uh, or should I go on to USMCA? Yeah, I no, I, I would just briefly say I, I agree. I mean, it, it is a uh, um, it, it says that uh, you're controlling it. So um, the um, uh, j just briefly, uh, I would just simply agree that, you know, sort of we're going to have to really understand the uncertainty around unemployment right now and continue to make the appropriate adjustments. Okay, uh, let's then the last topic before we get to questions, I want to spend a few minutes on, on USMCA. John, I noticed your face has disappeared. I don't know if that's be, <laughs> because of us or because of you, but I'm glad we can still hear you. Um, one of the, you know, the probably the most controversial issue in USMCA was automobile rules of origin. And uh, I know that one of the issues that has been fraught for your industry has been uh, the compliance uh, schedule and the, the details of the compliance process, which have been worked out uh, fairly recently, and the, the length of the compliance period that you're going to have once everything goes into effect July 1. I, I don't want particularly to get into the weeds of, of all that, but I would like you to talk about uh, sort of the, the, the bigger picture here, uh, again, in terms of workforce. Uh, because of the change in rules of origin, do you expect... Uh, there's going to be an increase of jobs and production in the United States, uh, or do you think you're going to be able to comply with the rules with essentially uh, the setup that you've got now? So um, I think, you know, I mean, it's, it's really a good question, Bill, but I, I think for us, um, we were really, um, a big part of working with USTR and the, and, and, and the other governments in crafting the rules of origin. So we've got a really good sense of what is going to be necessary for compliance. We feel very comfortable that we can be in compliance um, and are going to be in compliance uh, as soon as, you know, on inception. Um, one of the, one of the uh, mantras within the company is you build where you sell. And um, so a lot of our production in China is done in China. Uh, we, we produce vehicles in Mexico for Mexico that, but the USMCA is where we probably have the most integration. Um, and uh, the, the, the rules of origin, I don't think are gonna fundamentally change our footprint as it exists. It may encourage more uh, forward looking investment in the United States. I'll just give you some data that I found uh, pretty um, interesting about you know, what we've already done in the United States. And I wanna get this right, but over the past 10 years, we've invested 27 billion in US manufacturing. Uh, that's 26% of all U.S. automotive OEM manufacturing since 2010. Um, and just since, since 2019, we've invested $4 billion across six states, Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, Ohio, Tennessee, and Texas. I talked about the Orion facility. I think one of the reasons that we uh, put uh, an additional uh, $300 million investment in the Lake Orion, Michigan facility was in order to comply with the value content rules of origin. Um, that created approximately 400 jobs in the United States. So yeah, I think it will have an impact. Um, and um, I don't know it's gonna you know, change the whole dynamic, but it is certainly something we will take into consideration um, as we make investments and, um, and, and ensure compliance with the USMCA. Yeah, and, and Bill, I don't know, I think you can still hear me at least, right? Um, oh yes. I would I would simply just add to Everett that if you look at the industry broadly, I, I do think um, the the new rules of origin will require certainly more investment in the region, and likely more investment uh, in the United States. Uh, as you know, the rules are uh, very complex, uh, more so than uh, we, you would typically see in a trade agreement. And so, uh, you know, there, there there will also be a compliance adjustment. Um, uh, but it's going to vary. Some companies are going to be find it easier to comply. Other companies, there are going to be longer periods of adjustment and uh, uh, and longer lead time required. Uh, but 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 clearly, the, the these are stringent rules that will likely uh, uh, lead to more investment. Okay, let's go to the questions we're getting from from our our listeners. And if we have time left at the end, I've got one or two more. The first one I think is primarily for Everett. 
why are ethanol-based flex fuel vehicles still a priority for GM and Ford? You don't have to answer about Ford. You can answer about GM. You know, it's a good, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't like to be categorical. I will say that we do not have a lot of flex fuel vehicles. Uh, we really are looking at battery electric uh, technology. Um, there's been a couple of announcements over the past few months, including um, uh, our what we call the Ultium battery system that is really going to be the foundation of our propulsion system for the battery electric vehicles. Um, as an engineering matter, the idea that you're going to have two propulsion systems in a vehicle seems to be inefficient and wasteful. And we believe that you can get to better outcomes with going full on battery technology production. So that's where we're putting our resources is to get the best, most efficient batteries with the utilizing you know, the, 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 the most efficient uh, amount of resources to get the maximum capacity as quickly as possible. And it's something we work on every day. So at GM, we're really committed to uh, that zero emissions future and the battery technology is key. Um, we had what we called an EV day uh, right before the pandemic really took hold in the United States where we invited policymakers and um, just all kinds of people from around the country to, to Michigan to see, you know, the interconnectedness of the battery uh, system, how it can serve many, many vehicles from, say, a Bolt to an EV Hummer, um, how, how it interfaces with charging systems, um, it, and how you can design around it. And it is a really cool technology that we're very excited about. So we're all in on the battery electric, and I think you're going to see some really neat announcements in the next coming uh, year, year or so. Okay. The next question is from Manny, and I think uh, uh, our friend Manny Manriquez, and I think uh, John will start with uh, you for this one. What might be the long-term implica implications of the pandemic and the threat of future pandemics on the nature of automo automotive manufacturing operations in particular? Yeah, boy, that's a that's a that's a long, long question. <laughs> you can get, you can get uh, into later. Question. Yeah. Um, so, and thanks for that question, Manny. Um, so, a couple of couple of things to think about. One one is we talked about the supply chain impacts already. I do, I do think their resilience of uh, supply chain resilience is one uh, obvious place where I think companies will need to uh, continue to look. Um, uh, I think an, another uh, area, of course, is continuing to reimagine the manufacturing process. Uh, we certainly may see a little bit more automation in the manufacturing uh, system. We will certainly, and we're already seeing, uh, again, uh, safety systems built into the manufacturing process, flexibly glass shields where you can socially distance uh, production workers and those types of things. So I do, I do think manufacturing, the manufacturing process will change um, uh, as well as as the supply chains. The question really will be, um, you know, sort of how long lasting are these changes and, you know, whether, you know, this is a period until we see a vaccine or whether this is uh, something that's a little bit longer lasting than that. My, my best guess is that some of these changes we're seeing built into the manufacturing process will be long lasting. Everett, do you want to comment? Yeah, I think John, you know, pointed out a really critical factor. You know, if this is something where a vaccine is developed in a few months and uh, we're all back to normal, they, yeah, I don't think you're going to see the kind of transformative work environment uh, that everybody may be envisioning. Um, but if it is something that lingers, then the protocols that have been put into place um, are going to be very much part of the manufacturing process for us. And I think uh, the face shields, the social distancing, um, the number of people in, you know, working in proximity to each other, it's, it's something that we're gonna be very diligent about because the safety of the workers is critical. And without a safe, competent workforce, we're not gonna be able to produce the vehicles we need to produce. So um, it, I think it's a little early to tell, but it's, it is uh, definitely, uh, 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 the, the length of the pandemic is 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 going to be a critical factor. Well, that leads right in conveniently right into the next question, which is, um, would it be fair to say that as we are continuing to grapple with the pandemic, which I think means if it continues and that doesn't immediately go away, people may be wary of going back to using public transit. 
uh, and thus the auto industry may see a further upsurge. You think that's right or not? We don't, I mean, I think it's too early to say candidly. I think that um, we have seen, oh, as John pointed out in his opening remarks, uh, the desire uh, by consumers to purchase vehicles is still there. And um, there's a lot of different trends, I think, going on. Um, we had pretty robust uh, you know, truck sales, SUV sales. I think that people have seen the impact of the, um, uh, you know, on the environment. And, and so I think that may heighten interest in electric vehicles. Um, I wouldn't want to predict whether shared mobility is going to decrease at this point. I really think it's too early to tell. Um, so, I, I mean, John may have a more, a more uh, concrete answer on that, but I just would hesitate to say that. Oh, I fully agree that it's too early to tell. Um, you know, I, I do think, you know, the anecdotal evidence would suggest that people prefer to, you know, people in, in uh, suburban areas and, uh, you know, that where, where they're traditionally commuting, you know, may, may favor cars in the short term, perhaps. Um, but really, it's hard to tell what that what 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 the trend will look like long term. Okay, this next one is this is a really interesting one that that uh, uh, I think uh, Everett will start with you, and then I think last John to comment more generally. As cars become increasingly advanced, uh, computers on wheels for electric vehicles, vehicles and autonomous vehicles especially, are companies worried about theft of trade secrets by China? I know, for instance, GM has a large plant in Shanghai. Had there been spy threats there, are companies worried about that becoming collateral damage in the battle with uh, Huawei and CTE? Wow. Or bring back your NSC, NSC background to handle this one. Well, you know, we're always worried about protecting IP everywhere. Um, it's not just, you know, in one particular country. I mean, there's a competition for the latest IP around the world. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's a challenge we take very seriously in, in, in protecting it and our cybersecurity is, is absolutely top of mind. Um, absolutely. John? Yeah, I, just to add to that, I mean, look, of course, uh, companies have to be thoughtful uh, and protective of their IP, as Everett said. I, I, I'd almost want to flip things on their head a little bit, though. And, and, you know, there's another question that we also have to ask ourselves as we think about innovation in these transformative technologies, whether it's AVs or connected vehicles and advanced telematics or, or EVs. And that is, you know, are we able to, to not only innovate here, but export? our innovations. And so I, you know, I also think we have to be thinking about, you know, what the impact of, 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 of uh, export control policy, for example, is on U.S. innovation of advanced technologies as well. So, you know, both, both worried about, you got to worry about both sides of this equation, I think. Well, that's really interesting. As, as you probably know, I have some background in export control policy. Uh, how, does, how does that impact your industry? I mean, I, it's the, the, I, the cars really are computers on wheels, but uh, what, what kinds of things are, are subject to export controls that uh, involve you guys? Well, you, 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 the, the, it's a question, right? So in other words, if you start to think about uh, the AI associated with highly automated vehicles, for example, and you ask the uh, question, is that, is that dual use technology? I don't know. And so, you know, this is, you know, it needs to be something that has, has to be thought about as we continue to explore what we mean uh, uh, in this space. Uh, but 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 automotive AI is a great example. Well, and I think the fact that the question comes up as reflective of of the, the in a way that the nature of the extent to which the the automobile itself has changed over the years, it really is a very high tech device, uh, and it is a computer on wheels. And that means that uh, folded into it are not only a lot of advanced hardware, uh, but a lot of sophisticated software. Uh, and that does have the implications of the question you're asked about. So um, that's something that we're, I think is going to continue to, uh, something that you guys are going to continue to have to think about going forward. Uh, finally, let me just ask, um, because we, we've sort of uh, touched on this a little bit, but uh, just sort of a, uh, a yes or no might be a good one to close here. Can the industry recover before a vaccine becomes widely available? 
Can I use more than one word? You can, you can use more than one word. Go ahead. I would say our industry will adapt. Um, if you look at, and I know we short, I don't know how short on time we are, but if you look at what we've done in the past six months in the changing environment, we will adapt. Um, so um, it's the expertise, it's the people and the knowledge that enables us to do that. John? I, I think with Everett's definition, I, I would say the answer is yes. That yes, you can recover before a vaccine. Okay, excellent. Yes, well, that's yes, by, yes, by adapting, right? So in other words, um, you know, there's going to continue right. to be a constant reinvention. You know, and again, Bill, I don't know how much time we have, but just take how dealers have reacted to the pandemic, how they've gone to a clock. Uh, we have a shop click drive, you know, home delivery. I mean, we will. It's so when you say recover, I mean, will, it, will things go exactly the back the way they were? Probably not. Will we still thrive and innovate? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a good point. One of the things that one of the conclusions that I would draw from this and and we are really at the at the end now. Uh, <laughs> One of the conclusions that I would draw is that uh, is uh, the really endless creativity of, of the industry. And as Everett said, not just uh, at the manufacturing end, but at the sales and, and, and dealer end too. People, uh, one of the things that I think Americans are good at are coping, is coping and figuring out ways to get, work around uh, whatever barriers are constructed. This is a really big barrier uh, and it has the additional uh, challenge of occurring very, very quickly. Uh, sometimes, uh, particularly in technology, which is moving faster and faster, you still have you know, months or years to see what's coming and you have time to plan. Uh, with COVID-19, you didn't really have much time to see what was coming. Uh, and what you guys have, have I, I think, demonstrated is that the industry is doing a good job of, of, of uh, figuring out what it needs to do to survive and thrive going forward. So I commend you for that. Uh, and we are at the end. We promised you an hour. We've gone a couple of minutes over. So let me close just by, by thanking both of you uh, for uh, some very, very interesting and, and thoughtful comments. Uh, at least it gave me a, a lot of things to think about. And thank you to uh, all of our listeners uh, for uh, staying with us uh, for this and for some, submitting some really interesting questions. Uh, we will continue this, uh, this uh, feature uh, with another industry in a few weeks, and we'll be back to you with an announcement about that. So thank you very much, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. thank you, Bill.